Hello, my name is Daniel Blackburn, and today we're going to talk about the basic parameters and the concepts behind optimizing the composting process or any organic matter uh, recycling project. Alright, so what are we talking here? We're talking about the, the basic parameters, the science behind uh, composting and organic matter recycling. So you will probably hear sometime uh, if you've been online on forums that composting and vermicomposting is more like an art than a science. That you, uh, the, the reason people say that is because it's a very complex system and you have to equilibrate many different parameters. So you can either do it intuitively or you can do it highly technified monitoring and knowing what you're doing. So when you do it at home, <clears throat> most of people will do it intuitively uh, using their uh, previously previous experience uh, and knowledge. And they know what they works, they know what doesn't work. But when you do it at large scale, you need to know exactly what you're doing and you have to plan ahead before you cannot go blind on this thing. So it's important to understand these concepts. So when you go for these um, large scale um, projects, you will have to be very accurate on what you're doing. So let's go. So to start uh, the composting or any organic matter recycling project, just to start the, uh, talking about this, it's a biological process. It means the microbes are doing the work for you and microbes are living beings and uh, in case you're doing uh, vermicomposting, there will be not microbes, it will be uh, invertebrates, the, the worms will be most, doing most of the work together with the microbes. But in, in hot composting, what you have is you have input of organic matter and this organic matter will grow to go through a process of decomposition, aerobic decomposition. And there are some key factors here. Yeah, we have temperature, we have oxygen, we have moisture. We have the type of material that's coming in and you have properties of this mixture of materials that will heavily influence how this process will go, which type of microbes will grow, what is the su succession of these microbes, what type of material they produce afterwards. And so all these, these uh, uh, parameters are very important. And let's talk a little bit and define a little bit this concept. So when we, when we explain on the next lecture how to handle and optimize hot composting, you will have these uh, concepts very clear and it will be easy for you to follow up. Uh, all right, so first, first of all, what do the microbes do in this uh, system? They are consuming the organic matter. These are heterotrophic microbes uh, uh, and they are uh, um, using this organic matter as a source of carbon and using the organic matter also as a source of energy. So, so they're chemoorganotrophs and they're heterotrophs. Um, these microbes, these, these are the ones that we usually use for hot composting, but there's some, some contribution from anaerobes. But the anaerobic decomposition is undesired mostly because it will produce some bad odors and some compounds that could be even toxic for, for humans. So uh, we are looking for to have an aerobic process where you have an aerobic oxidation of the organic matter and you will produce some of this organic, organic matter will, be, become, will become CO2 and methane uh, and, and the rest of it will be stabilized as what you would call humus. Yeah? And this process is what we call the mineralization of the organic matter. Yeah? And in, also in this process, many nutrients will change their chemical form because they're being used by the microbes in different ways. And there are some groups of microbes, they will be using some chemical elements as a source of energy also, uh, like the nitrifying microbes or sulfur oxidizing microbes in this uh, compost pile. And they, they will transform the nutrients for different forms. So the stabilization of this organic matter during this decomposition is uh, what we are looking for. Yeah? We don't wanna add the, uh, the fresh organic matter to the soil before it's stabilized. So after it's stabilized, it's safe to use and will not harm the plants. 
Okay, so just uh, re-emphasizing, we are talking about heterotrophs and what they will do, they will, get, uh, they will go through this plant material or uh, 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 any, any organic material that you add there, and they will degrade this using it as a source of carbon and as a source of energy, and the products of that will be CO2 and uh, 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 oxidized forms of ammonium like nitrates and nitrates, um, uh, um, uh, sulfate, etc. And you have a lot of microbial biomass, beneficial microbial biomass for the soil, and this stabilized organic matter is what we call humus. Some of the parameters are very important during this process. The first and most basic one is moisture. So you want to have microbes or basically 90% uh, uh, water, and you will need to uh, have a high moisture content on this material. But you need to regulate this because on one hand, you want a high moisture content to bust the microbial biomass in their activity. But if you have too much of moisture, it will downplay the oxygen flow and the aeration of this, this component. So structure, moisture content, uh, airflow, or concepts, they are deeply uh, uh, interrelated. So bulk density structure, uh, uh, porosity of this material and uh, airflow are, are very interrelated. So you have to take care about how you 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 play these materials together so it, these things are uh, compensating each other. If you have a material that is very heavy with low porosity, you will need to have uh, lower uh, moisture content to allow more airflow into that. If you have a material that's more caraise and full of macropores, then you can go more heavily on the, the uh, have a, a higher moisture content to the material. So you need to be careful about this uh, in some uh, situations. Most of the time, what you're looking at, you have a target between 40 and 6% to optimize the decomposition process. And what it feels like on your hand is when you squeeze it, it will not, will not give water, but it will feel moist. If you squeeze it, it will not draw, drip, but it will, be, it will feel very moist, but it will not be dripping, okay? So the oxygen flow is the next thing. Yeah, the microbes, we are talking about aerobic microbes. We, are, we, want, and we, the, we want to secure that this process is an aerobic decomposition. And uh, in order to be aerobic, you need to have oxy conditions. And the oxygen flow is very important. So you will see very often that the, 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 the compost, the, the home composting uh, uh, devices that are sold in the market, they're completely blocked with uh, plastic. And this is terrible for the, for, the, for the decomposition process. You're just blocking the airflow through that compost pile trying to hide the smells and that's actually you are ju just decreasing the speed in which this material is being decomposed. So what you want is it's some have some material like fences like you have here in the situation where there's a free airflow. You can su support the, the, the compost pile, but at the same time, you will have uh, plenty of airflow through that compost pile. Uh, Always use structuring material, so things like wood chips or, or uh, hay, things that will uh, make the, the, the compost pile more fluffy, more uh, aerated, with more micropores. This is, you always want to secure that you have enough of these uh, to make that this compost pile uh, uh, will be aerobic during the, the composting process. All right, so some of the oxygen flow is diffusive. Some of it is convective. What, what do I mean by this, diffusive and convecting? During the decomposition, we're going to talk about temperature, but during the decomposition of the, the, the organic matter, the, the microbes are generating heat on this, uh, on this compost pile. And this hot air is flowing through the compost pile and coming out of the compost pile. As it goes through, it's dragging fresh air inside. Yeah, as, it, as the hot air goes out, it's dragging fresh air inside. This flux of air that is a, a, a mass flow, this is what we call a convective, you know, a convective flux. 
And this is very important for the speed of, of decomposition during the thermophilic phase. Uh, but also when you have the maturing process, you are more reliant on diffusive process for the, the airflow. So the, 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 the convective uh, uh, process is, um, it's, uh, uh, it will promote more oxygenation, whereas the diffusion process, uh, it will be a, a slower uh, flow. So the, it, also with the convective process, you need, you need to make sure that is happening with this, uh, creating that structure on the material uh, because if the heat is completely uh, maintained inside the, the compost pile it could even overheat yeah but the, the, it will build co2 and overheat and even create anoxic conditions inside the, the compost pile so that structure in the creation of the macropores in the compost pile is a way that you will secure also that you have enough convective um, ventilation of the compost pile. Redox potential is the other thing you have to think about. Yeah? Redox potential is, uh, we're talking about the, uh, if uh, you have more anaerobic conditions or more aerobic conditions. So what you, what you, you need to think about is that if you have low oxygen on, on, the, on the compost pile, you will have a, a, a reducing condition. If you have high oxygen, it will be an oxidation condition. And what we want is an oxidizing condition for this process to happen. The decomposition of the organic matter under uh, reducing conditions is very slow. And when you have it under oxi oxidizing condition, this is very fast. Uh, also, it's, uh, the uh, oxidation is what releases the heat uh, during the, the, the decomposition. So the, the thermophilic phase is highly dependent on having these uh, uh, oxic conditions. So also several compounds will have uh, reduced forms or oxidized forms. And uh, some of the reduced forms will be more, uh, 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 will be inconvenient for us for having, let's say uh, the methane will have a bad odor, will be, uh, uh, atmospheric contaminant. Yeah, the hydrogen sulfide created in, 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 in reducing conditions will be also uh, an atmospheric contaminant and will create this bad odors. So we we want to create the oxy conditions uh, and we need to take care of the aeration to be uh, always in the moisture content to be always on the on the situation where you have enough oxygen on this on this um, compost pile. So it, it really affects the speed on which uh, uh, the, the, the material is decomposed. And what we need to always take care of is that uh, if we have anaerobic conditions, is then is in, when you have these anaerobic conditions, is the majority of the times when you have the inconvenience of having your uh, com home composting or even commercial composting. The, the bad odors, the, 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 the leachates, all the, 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 the nastiness of what you, when you think about the, the, this, the, the putrid old odors in the organic matter decomposition, this is usually associated with anaerobic conditions. So if you secure that you have always a, a, a good airflow in your compost pile and you do not overuse fresh material like you see here, then you will avoid the production of these bad odor molecules like ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, uh, and um, methane. Yeah. So we are talking about fluffiness, and the fluffiness is uh, in a very informal term. The, the correct way of, of talking about this is about bulk density. Yeah, bulk density is that if you have a low bulk density, think about like a sponge, something that has a low mass for the same volume. And if you have a high bulk density, think about something like very, uh, uh, like, like a rock, for example, or a brick, like you have here in the figure. So the more compacted the material is, the higher the bulk density you will have, the, the less compacted the material, it will be a, a lower bulk density. So we're looking for is, achieving the lowest book density you can during this decomposition process. So you have a very aerobic situation in a quick decomposition of your material. 
Uh, porosity is directly related to uh, uh, book density. It means that the lower the book density, the, highest, the higher the porosity. Yeah? And uh, what you expect in organic matter uh, mixtures, you want the, 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 the porosity between 0 0.5 up to 0 0.8. You don't want this material to become compacted. Yeah? Less than 50% pores is absolutely, you don't want that. And uh, uh, you can calculate the porosity using the bulk density. Yeah? So you can, you can use this formula, 1 uh, uh, minus the bulk density over the particle density. So let's, and we can assume the particle density here in this situation to be 1.2, just for the sake of calculations. So let's see how you do these calculations. Yeah? So if, if you grab a, a cylinder or something that you know the volume, you can calculate the volume of the cylinder. You fill up with your material as it is, and uh, you take the, you you bring this material to the oven, and you get the oven dry weight, the, the dry material, and then you divide that weight by the volume. Then you will end up with your bulk density. Yeah, your bulk density is how many grams you have per cubic centimeter. And you want to have bulk densities as low as possible, so something between 0.5. It's, it's, it's good, it's fine, yeah? So from here to calculate the porosity, what you will do is uh, one minus book density over particle density. So we are assuming here particle density to be uh, 1.2, and that will give you the porosity. How many cubic centimeters of pores do you have over the total cubic centimeters of the of the compost yeah so this porosity here as in this example for the calculations end up being a 0 0.58 or 58 percent so the particle size plays a big role in this so you have you have to play this very carefully when you are uh, doing at home you you want to have some amount of large particles even though that will make that the composition will be slower. Yeah? If you have industrial compost, you want to have the finer particles, the better, and you want to work with uh, uh, turning the wind row as, as often as you can, or having forced airflow through the compost pile. And you can secure the aeration through these mechanical processes, either pumping air uh, through the, the compost pile, or turning that compost pile very often. But because you would not be turning your compost pile at home very often, what you really want to do is that you want to have structuring material. You have, you have to have materials that will guarantee that there's a good airflow in this uh, compost pile. And by, by, by the structuring material are usually a big particle. So you have leaves, uh, uh, not chopped leaves and um, wood chips and things that will create those macropores. But those big particles, it means that the composition will be slower. But you need to have this balance. If you're not turning this very often, the, the compost pile, then you need to secure that you have structuring materials. Uh, the particle size uh, affects the, the speed of the composition because of the surface area. If you have a large particle, the microbes will have access to the outside of this large particle. But if you have a small particle, imagine all the surfaces that are exposed for the microbes to attack. The, the, the enzymes from these microbes will be uh, have a lot of access for the material. Whereas if you have large particles, that will take a long time for the microbes to dig through this material and break it down. Uh, and if, if you look here in this graphic on the side, if you have that the materials are very structured, you will have uh, uh, the thermophilic phase will, will come very quick uh, and will, will heat up very well. Uh, whereas if you have uh, structuring materials, the heat will not be so, so high, but you will guarantee that you have airflow even though uh, you don't turn the pile very often. pH is the next uh, the next parameter that we need to talk about. Uh, the pH will will uh, what is pH? Yeah, pH is a measurement of the concentration of hydrogen. And why is that important? 
the, the, the pH is a master variable. pH will control chemistry, precipitation, dissolution, uh, uh, adsorption. It will control the speed of chemical reaction, will control the direction of some chemical reactions, will have influence in the, uh, in the, the EH, the, the redox potential. It will have a lot of uh, impact on the biology. Some organisms are able to survive in one range of pH, but not in others. So pH is a master variable. And the, this pH will control a lot of the processes, how they're happening. And what usually happens in a hot compost process is that the pH goes down at the start of this process, where the, the initial decomposition of the organic matter releases a lot of organic acids. And this, uh, this release of organic acids, uh, also there's a lot of protons coming out. So the concentration of hydrogen goes up, pH go, goes down. So pH is an inverse log scale, as you see here on the bottom. What this means as an inverse log, log scale is uh, every point of pH that goes down, you have 10 times more, uh, the molar concentration of hydrogen in the solution. That means from pH 7 to pH 6, you will have 10 times more hydrogen. And if you move upwards, like from pH 6 to pH 7, you have 10 times less hydrogen. And this hydrogen is responsible for controlling a lot of different things in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, composting environment, including the action of microbes in, the, in, in their enzymes. Many enzymes, they will, they will have active configurations only at a certain pH range, whereas if you have in, uh, the pH changing for a, a different range, it will make these enzymes become inactive and the decomposition will be slowed down. But this process is part of the nat natural microbial succession that happens on the compost. It will go down for the start and then it will go up and it will stabilize in the slightly alkaline range. This is what you expect during the composting process. Nevertheless, when you do cold composting and you are continuously adding uh, organic material, it is possible and it's, it happens sometimes that you have the, 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 this material becomes acidic, very acidic. Or if you use a cold composting that is only made of high carbon material like leaves, for example, or sawdust, you will find out that this uh, the, uh, the, the material will generate a lot of acidity, acidity. So you will end up with a very acid material and this not uh, highly desired. So uh, some ways of dealing with this is uh, equilibrate the, 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 the mixture of material you have at the start, or alternatively, you will have to lime this uh, cold compost or add some type of lime uh, that will uh, increase the pH. Yeah. So there's a strong relationship between the pH and the type of ions that are dissolved in the solution. It, it, this decrease in pH means that the, the organic matter is releasing a lot of hydrogen on the solution. But when the bases, during the, the mineralization of the organic matter, when the bases are released and compensate that hydrogen, then these bases will uh, uh, allow the pH to go back to uh, neutral or slightly alkaline conditions. All right. All right, so let's talk about uh, uh, nitrogen transformations and what happens uh, in a compost pile, the type of nitrogen compost uh, um, transformations that we see, what happens with the different source of, of carbon Let's talk about nutrient stoichiometry on the compost pile or in the organic matter decomposition in general and how this affects. Yeah, we are, we are ending up talking about again the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Yeah, but we will see here there's a lot more to carbon to nitrogen ratio than uh, normally is talked about. So let's get in the nitty gritty and let's talk about the nitrogen cycle and what is happening in the comp compost pile. If you have a compost situation, a cold compost, where you, you only have high uh, carbon material, where do the nitrogen comes from to the decomposition? If you, if you find out a long-lasting uh, pile of sawdust, for example, 
if after 10 years, 15 years, this old dust becomes completely decomposed and humidified, where did the nitrogen came from? Some of the nitrogen comes from atmospheric deposition, but some of that nitrogen comes from what we call the diazotropes. Yes, there are some of the free living microbes that occupy that community, a, a, a small fraction, but an important fraction, a functionally important fraction of those microbes they will be fixing atmospheric nitrogen and it, they're non-symbiotic. The in, in whole nature, the majority of the nitrogen fixation is coming through symbiosis uh, between uh, legumes and rhizobium. But in the compost pile, we are talking about uh, microbes or free living microbes that are able to fix uh, atmospheric nitrogen. This is uh, a process which is uh, uh, energy demanding for the microbe. The microbes need to spend a lot of energy to make this uh, um, process. So uh, they are not the fastest growing or uh, not, not usually a, a big proportion. But in some situations, when you have the composition of uh, material with high carbon to nitrogen ratio, these microbes are important on re-equilibrating that carbon to nitrogen ratio on the long term. Yeah? So this is one of the nitrogen transformations that you will see in organic matter decomposition. Yeah. The, 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 the normal and more obvious one is the mineralization. You have organic nitrogen uh, bound to the DNA, to proteins in the cell. And this nitrogen is uh, uh, the, the most common enzyme is the amino transferase. And then will the yes, amino transferase will uh, hydrolyze this uh, amino group and make ammonium. And this ammonium can be either nitrified uh, or can be lost uh, by volatilization. And here's the, in the bottom you have the volatilization of the ammonium. At the same time, you will see also that some of the microbes will be taking the nitrogen from the solution and immobilizing that in organic forms. So these microbes are working both ways. They're mineralizing and they're immobilizing. So when you have high carbon to nitrogen ratio material, the microbes are hungry for nitrogen and they will take the nitrogen from the solution and will use that nitrogen to make organic molecules. As you say, make more proteins, make more DNA in the cells. And as they do that, there is less nitrogen for the other microbes to, to use. So there is a, a general starvation of the system for nitrogen. So this balance between mineralization and immobilization is important. And if you have enough nitrogen on the system, this balance will be towards mineralization. It will increase the extracellular uh, nitrogen uh, concentration in form of ammonium in the form of nitrates and nitrates. And if you have uh, 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 unbalanced situation that you have low nitrogen uh, concentration, the balance will always be towards the immobilization and the, the solution will be uh, uh, with low concentration of nitrogen. So it's important to take, uh, take, take that into account to understand these processes, what are happening throughout the, 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 the decomposition process. The next step is if you have ammonium in the system, these, uh, the, there are chemolithotrophic microbes in this environment that they will use that ammonium as a source of energy. Yeah, they will use it as a source of energy. There are two groups of microbes that are mainly responsible for this, the nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. They are uh, aerobic microbes and they are using this ammonium and oxidizing this ammonium in order to obtain energy. And during this process, there are release of protons. So there's an acidification of the compost pile. Uh, uh, and if you create anaerobic conditions, and then you will have a process which is called the denitrification, where some anaerobic microbes will use the nitrates and nitrates as a source of oxygen to make electron acceptors for the respiration process. And in, in doing that, they will reduce the nitrogen and make uh, 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 N2 gas, yeah, the atmospheric nitrogen. 
So that was for the uh, uh, quick reminder of all the, the nitrogen processes that are happening. These are usually what we talk about that are happening on the soil, but also in the compost pile. These are all the complexity that you will see on the nitrogen. Mineralization, uh, immobilization, um, uh, volatilization of ammonium, uh, nitrification, and denitrification processes. Now, when we talk about the carbon side, because we are arriving in the concept of carbon to nitrogen ratio, and we already seen that uh, there's a lot of complexity on the nitrogen side, and this, this ty the type of processes or the availability of that nitrogen is changing de depending on the conditions of the environment. When we talk about the carbon side, there are, there, are, there are other complexities. And the main complexity that we see on the carbon side is that not every carbon molecule is as easy for the microbes to utilize as uh, they're, they're different from each other. So think about yourself when you're eating sugar or you're eating fiber. The fiber will go undigested. The sugar, you will use it, use it very uh, quickly. They're both carbon molecules. So for the microbes, it's the same thing. The, the, there, there's some... Uh, uh, carbon molecules that will be very easy for them to use, some of them will be hard. So it will take more energy for the microbe to extract energy from those molecules. It will take them a lot of uh, uh, processing, making more enzymes uh, uh, for the hydrolysis of that organic matter, whereas other molecules are easy for them to use. So in general, you will say that uh, lipids, uh, uh, DNA, uh, uh, of course, RNA and proteins, sugars, they're very easy to use, but when you go for the, the, the fats, lignin, cellulose, they will be harder for the microbes to use. So the, the plant material will have all this composition uh, and a, a big chunk of it will be hard for the microbes to use, will have a lot of cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, uh, and this, uh, uh, this um, fiber-rich material will uh, end up making up the bulk of what will become the humus. So the undigested carbon material by, for the microbes, that will become the stabilized organic matter afterwards. It's not going to be the original cellulose or the lignin or the hemicellulose, but the transformed one by the microbes, where the microbes will use some of it and will change it uh, through, their, uh, through their enzymes uh, but uh, this is the, 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 the initial, initial carbon that will later become the stabilized humus, whereas the easy carbon sources will be consumed by the microbes in this process and will become CO2. So the mineralization, as I was talking, uh, these are, uh, they have different rates. So if you, have, if you say a material is high in carbon, it doesn't mean it's uh, uh, they're available carbon for the microbes. You know, most likely, the majority of it will be unavailable. So it's, there's a difference on on, uh, on the, the type of carbon that the material contains. So if you have woody materials, uh, they will be high in carbon, but at the same time, this material, the carbon will be not highly available for the microbes. Most of that carbon will stay through the decomposition process and will make part of the final stabilized compost at the end. So what is the fast uh, decomposing materials? Sugar, starches, protein, uh, the slower ones are hemicellulose, cellulose, and the, the very, very slow ones, fat, fat waxes, and lignin. So that, that is when we arrive in the concept of nutrient stoichiometry or the famous carbon to nitrogen ratio. And you can even include carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus ratio if you want uh, in this. Also, you can include more nutrients that are critical for these uh, microbes. If they are starving for one, it means that they will not be able to use the other one. So th this is uh, the... Uh, what is the limiting factor? Yeah? I, will, I will show you a table here the next one, if you look at the bottom of this table here, what is the carbon to nitrogen ratio of a bacteria? It's about five of actinomycet nematodes, about six of a fungi, about 10. What does this mean? It means that for every nitrogen, that uh, the, every, uh, for every um, uh, 
five molecules of carbon that the microbe use, it needs to take one molecule of nitrogen to make more cells. So there's a proportion that the microbes need to keep when they're making more material, more cell material. They have this internal composition that does not change too much when they make new cells. So if they have to take it for every five uh, molecules of carbon, one of nitrogen, it, 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 it will, if, if you don't have enough nitrogen, what happens is at some point you will still have a lot of carbon, but all the nitrogen is consumed. So there is a, a starvation for nitrogen on the system. Yeah? So this is the concept behind new, uh, the nutrient stoichiometry is that the microbes, they have their own internal composition. And when they make more cells, what actually they're doing is they need to keep the proportion of different nutrients. And the, the proportion they have inside is between five and 10. It will not change yeah? the, the proportion between carbon and nitrogen. So what we say is we, we, we start with the, the carbon to nitrogen proportion of the material up between 25 and 30 to 1. Why is that? Why do we think 25 to 30 to 1 when the microbes are between 5 and 10? The reason is here, a good proportion of this carbon is highly unavailable for these microbes. So you have some uh, some good amount of lignin cellulose and hemicellulose that is not available for the microbes. So you need to give more carbon to give enough available carbon and keep it at the stoichiometry in a good proportion. So for a good decomposition uh, uh, rate, you need to keep uh, a balance of carbon to nitrogen ratio between 25 and 30 to one in the start condition of the composting. And that, that carbon to nitrogen ratio will have a dynamic, it will change and it will stabilize in a lower level later on. Yeah. All right. So what happens if you have too high carbon to nitrogen ratio? And then what happens if you have too low carbon to nitrogen ratio? If you have it too high, it means that you have a, a nitrogen mobilization and you have not a starvation for the nitrogen and the decomposition rate will be very slow. If you have too much nitrogen, what will happen is the microbes will grow too quickly and they will deplete all the oxygen from the, 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 the compost pile in, the, in the, the rate of respiration will be so strong that you will create anaerobic conditions at the same time. So if you have too much nitrogen, you will end up creating some anaerobic conditions because of the oxygen depletion and because of the fast growth of these microbes. So you want to have an, equi an equilibrium on this, uh, uh, on this side, and the equilibrium is usually taken between 25 and 30 to 1. Yeah, 25 and 30 to 1. So when we talk about when we talk about how to manage. Uh, uh, hot compost, I will, I will uh, show you quick calculations about how to use uh, a uh, 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 carbon to nitrogen ratio to calculate the proportion of the materials that you will use on your hot compost. Yeah, but for now, it's for you understanding the, the concept, you know, the concept of the balance of the nutrient stoichiometry between carbon and nitrogen. So here, again, this is a table that I just showed you. This showing uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio, carbon composition in percentage, nitrogen composition in percentage, and the carbon to nitrogen ratio of different materials. So do you have some materials with very high carbon to nitrogen ratio and some with very low carbon to nitrogen, nitrogen ratio? The, uh, the, the ones with very low carbon to nitrogen ratio are the ones that you have to worry about because these will become uh, uh, putrid with bad smells, anaerobic decomposition will give leachates. So the, the high carbon to nitrogen ratio are the very stable ones, sawdust, leaves, shredded newspaper. Yeah? These are things that will be very stable, so you can keep and store. But the ones that are fresh, the greens, will be very unstable and you need to take care of them. So you will stabilize the greens by using the Browns, you know, so high carbon to nitrogen ratio would be the browns, the low carbon to nitrogen ratio would be the greens.
And now that is because of the microbes here on the, on the bottom that you see, because of their internal carbon to nitrogen ratio, and they have to keep that balance. More uh, list of carbon to nitrogen ratio of different materials, just for you to consult if you want. All right, so this is what, what we were talking just now. Informally, we call the high carbon to nitrogen ratio materials the browns, in uh, the low carbon to nitrogen ratio the greens. And in using that balance between browns and greens is the highly important parameter that you want to keep in mind to avoid those anaerobic conditions. Or if you want to speed up the compost, you need to have that very well calibrated. If you're not too concerned about speeding up the, the, the composting process, but you just want to be safe on not having those nasty conditions of anaerobios, what you, what you really, really want to do is put more high carbon materials, more browns, yeah? put more browns on your, on your uh, compost pile. So you, this is why the browns are high, highly valuable, in, in especially in home composting. You, when you're doing home composting, you're concerned about your family, the neighbors, about pests. You, you're, you're concerned about many things, yeah? And you don't want to go wrong on this. So it's better to go safe. And the way to go safe is you value the browns and you err on the side of using a lot of browns in your compost and in your very compost and always in your organic matter recycling err on the side of using a lot of browns and the useful of the browns will be balancing the 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 the, the, the greens that are uh, fresh and putrid uh, prevent smells and uh, in anoxic conditions will absorb the excess of moisture from that material will will create airflow will prevent leaching uh, uh, will uh, uh, prevent the overheating of the compost material if you're doing hot composting. Uh, and will prevent the heating at all in very composting because this is also what you don't want for your worms. And will allow this, this give some pH buffering for that, uh, for that uh, decomposition. Even though, as a rule of thumb, you will expect a high carbon to nitrogen ratio materials, they will have acid pHs. So sometimes you have to buffer them to keep the pH in a neutral situation. So two little nitrogen again, slow decomposition, uh, 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 and but safe, no uh, no 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 big problems with anaerobios. If you have too much nitrogen, you will have a lot of ammonium emissions perhaps anaerobic conditions, and the, the, you may lose control of this decomposition. Okay, so the balance, if you see in this graphic here, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, if you balance it well, you will, you will get a good heating of your compost pile. If you, if you don't balance it, it will mean that it will not heat a lot. So the, the, if you put too much car carbon-rich material, the material will not heat too much. And if you have that you are managing a compost situation and your material is not heating well, then what you need is, you need to use more uh, greens, more nitrogen rich material. This is usually the, 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 the thing that you have to be concerned about. And to, to balance the, 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 the thermophilic phase and manage the thermophilic phase of your composting, this carbon to nitrogen ratio material will be very important. And as you see here, the carbon to nitrogen ratio tends to go down during the decomposition process and it will stabilize below 20, 15 to 20 uh, at the end of the process, depending on what the material you start with. But uh, the uh, highly mature compost will have low carbon to nitrogen below 20. All right, so when you, when you, what you have to keep in mind is also that when you use these materials, if you have a lot of uh, 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 anaerobios, you will have a lot, uh, uh, and low carbon to nitrogen in the start, you will uh, also have a lot of loss of methane and ammonia gas. And this emission of methane and ammonia, as you see here in the lower graphics, 
this is one of the things that you want to avoid because this is what's causing most of the bad smell. So this, the, we already talked about temperature quite a lot until now, but we let's see what are the phases. Yeah, let's define well what are the phases of uh, the compost in the hot compost. So you have the mesophilic phase, we have the thermophilic phase, and then you come back to a mesophilic phase for maturation of the compost. During the thermophilic phase is where most of the organic matter decomposition is happening. Yeah, this thermophilic phase is a highly accelerated rate of decomposition of the material. And you kind of want to have it if you're looking for efficiency. If you're looking for efficiency in the composting process, you need to generate that three, four weeks of high temperature in the material. When you do that, you for sure, you're gonna stabilize the material very quick. If you were not concerned about the speed of the composition, as, as you should not be in home composting, then you you can have uh, you can air and have more carbon and have this thermophilic phase be as uh, maybe not a thermophilic phase but only mesophilic for a long time. Long time, yeah. So uh, thermophilic phase uh, over uh, uh, over 45 degrees and that will last about three four weeks. And then after that, you will uh, come back to uh, mesophilic and maturation st stage of the compost. Yeah. When you when the compost is finished, the temperature should be very similar to the temperature of the outside temperature of, of, of the of the air. You know, not more than five degrees of what the, the the air is outside. If this is not happening, it means your compost is not mature. Yeah. So let's talk about why this is happening. One, one is what is the, the 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 thing about the the thermophilic phase? The thermophilic phase, you will have basically no activity of the fungi. The fungi, these dot dashed lines here. These are the mesophilic fungi and uh, thermophilic fungi. These are not happening on the initial stages of the thermo thermophilic phase. When the compost pile heats up, what will happen immediately is that the bacteria will take over and will take all the easy sugars and easy molecules and will decompose them very quickly. That is a, a, a very quick action and that will uh, help uh, in accelerate this process. Now, when it comes to the maturation phase, the stabilization of this process, this is when the fungal biomass will take over and create this stability. The fungi are very important in dealing with those recalcitrant carbon forms, cellulose, lignin, hemicellulose. These are mainly the concern about the fungi and the decomposition and stabilization of those molecules happen after the thermophilic phase. So it's not that you just end up the thermophilic phase and your, your compost is mature, you need to give time for the fungi to, to, to finish it and, and uh, uh, give that maturity. So there is some of the maturation of this uh, organic matter that happens uh, after your, your pile is cooling down. And uh, it's important, very, very important that you keep the moisture during this process. You don't allow it to completely dry Otherwise, you will have a dry material which is not finished. So, uh, uh, if you if you uh, if you want to sell it quick, you want it to be dry. But it's you should think about if you want a high quality material, you should keep the moisture for another month minimum after your compost is cooled down. So that will guarantee that you have that maturation process, which is a fungal dominated phase. Yeah. So this is the, about the microbial succession during the, the, the phases. You have mesophilic phase, uh, uh, which normally is less than a week when, when the compost is heating up. You have a thermophilic phase that will go several weeks uh, uh, after uh, over 45 degrees, 40 to 45 degrees, depending on the literature that you cite. And then after this, this phase, which is highly dominated by bacteria, 
then you will it will come a maturation phase, a, a curing phase, which is uh, will have some amount of temperature, but not too much. And uh, when it's, this material is completely cooled down, is when you deem that this material is finished. Yeah, this material is finished. So what we what we think about a finished material, what we want is that this material is full of organic colloids. Colloids, the definition of colloids are things that can stay in suspension. Yeah, when you mix that with water, they are not dissolved in water, but they do not settle on the bottom. They will be stay suspended. And this suspended material, they're very, very fine particles. And because they are fine, they have a lot of good properties. You know, they have high surface area, they have high cation exchange capacity. Uh, and they, uh, they, they, are full, they are covered with nutrients. They are storing a huge amount of nutrients for, for the plants. So this humidify, humidified material, humidified material, the organic colloids is what you want on your finished, uh, mat uh, finished uh, organic matter that you have at, at any composting process. The type of charges that you have on this material, these are pH dependent charges. It means that the, uh, the cation exchange capacity will be high, but you cannot say it is this amount. It depends on the pH it is. It, the highest the pH, the more charge you will have, the lowest the pH, as it approaches the zero point charge, you will have less charge in the materials. So pH dependent charge is the type of charge that are generated on the, 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 the acid and hydroxyls on the edge of these organic molecules. This oxygen, they can be protonated and deprotonated. It means that if the pH is low, you have a high concentration of hydrogen on the solution, the hydrogen will bind to the structure of the organic matter and will create positive charges. Whereas if you have uh, 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 high alkaline uh, conditions, there is low concentration of hydrogen on the solution. The hydrogen will leave the surface of the molecule and will then generate negative charges on the surface. This is what we call pH dependent charge. This is what you have in organic matter. And you have a lot of the, these potential charges, but this the exact amount of this cation exchange capacity is dependent on the pH. Yeah? Okay, so this is all that I have to bring for you today. These are basic concepts that some of them are borrowed from soil science and uh, some of them are exclusive for uh, uh, composting. But when we talk about how to manage hot compost, cold compost, vermicompost in the next lectures, uh, I, I will not go through these concepts again. I will just uh, 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 explain the mechanics of operating in in uh, managing these, these situations, okay? Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed. See you next lecture.